Um, my name is Daniel Amstutz. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner for the Town of Arlington with the Department of Planning and Community Development. I'm here with folks from Kittleton and Associates, which is um, the consultants that uh, we've hired to help us work on this project, the Main Event Bikeway Planning Project. <clears throat> and so this is our first official um, public meeting presentation about this project, and we're gonna learn a lot about it tonight. And uh, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so here's our agenda for tonight. We'll do, I will let Kittleson introduce themselves in a couple of minutes when we get to their slides over a very brief background about this project and how we got here. Um, Kittleson and uh, folks staff are going to go over some initial findings about that. We'll talk about some next steps and then there'll be some Q&A. And, and the idea is that we'll have some breakout groups here. Um, we had uh, quite a few people that are registered for this meeting. And so if we if we get over a certain, a certain number of people, it'll be difficult to do the breakouts, but we'll, we'll see when we get there. Um, I hope we will be able to do them because uh, I think that'll be a really good part of the session. Uh, and the idea is that after those breakout groups, we will report back. Um, so on the next slide, I think we've got some general ground rules. So this is a Zoom meeting. This is being recorded. Um, it will be rebroadcast or plan to be rebroadcast and put on the uh, YouTube page for ACMI, which is the Arlington Community Media Inc. Everyone uh, is muted. Um, please keep yourself muted during the presentation. We'll have the opportunity, of course, to have some Q&A and then the breakout groups, like I mentioned, where uh, you'll be able to unmute yourselves. Um, and when we get to that point, you know, if you feel comfortable, put the camera on uh, so that we can see you and have this try to be more like a conversation, that would be fine. We have the chat open, but it's really just for asking questions of the host and the presenters. So um, um, not for sort of asking other people questions or having side conversations. And uh, here's some information about the mute and unmute buttons. They should be on the lower left corner of the Zoom screen, or if you've got a toolbar, uh, you can raise your hand. They sort of move things around. It should be now under reactions that you can raise your hand. And that's sort of the method that we can use for the, the Q&A. Um, and if you are calling in by phone, you can R9 for muting and unmuting and star six to raise your hand. So on to the next slide. So I'll give just two minutes or so of a brief back. Um, I, this part of the Miniman Bikeway. So we know the Miniman Bikeway is about 10 miles long. It goes from Cambridge to Bedford uh, and also through Lexington. Um, but in 1993, it was um, built in the Arlington area. We had our 25th anniversary just a few years ago. And it runs 3.6 miles through Arlington, Massachusetts. And it's a really critical non-motorized travel corridor. Um, it runs over an old railroad bed. As you can see on the right side, a picture of the um, steam locomotive in the Lexington Center Depot back in the 1950s. Um, it's a, become a really, really critical, important benefit for the town. It connects people to public transportation, schools, parks, commercial centers, and other trails. Um, whether in Cambridge or in other places, uh, Bedford, Lexington, and other towns and cities, like I mentioned, uh, Cambridge, and then you know from then on you can get on to Boston or get on to Somerville or or some other areas if you're going into the big city. So it's really important. It's it so it connects to many destinations uh, for people to walk and bike and use other other means other than driving, and so it's a really mature kind of shared use path. We call it a bikeway, but it is really used by very large number of different people uh, using different uh, means of uh, wheeling or walking. <clears throat> and we really decided or, or thought that after this uh, time that it really, we really, really need to understand better how to keep the past safe and accessible to all and to plan for future investments. Uh, as we know that um, there are a lot of people that use a path that's been growing. It was before the pandemic growing in popularity but it's still uh, retained quite a lot of its usage um, over the last year, year and a half. Um, uh, the last thing I wanna say, I do wanna recognize that this project is also funded through Community Preservation Act funds. Um, so this is a, a CPA funded 
uh, project. Um, so we want to you know, acknowledge the committee and also the town meeting for um, helping us get this project going. So on to the next slide. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Liz Flanagan from Kittleson and Associates and uh, to introduce everyone and move on to the rest of the presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Flanagan. I'm a transportation planner with Kittleson and Associates. And I am joined tonight by some of my colleagues, um, some of the people who have facilitator in front of their name and will be helping with the breakout groups later. So Connor Semler, Megan Morrow, and Caitlin, Mil Caitlin Milner. Um, and then as well, we are being supported on this project by our partners at GPI. Um, so this map, just an overview of what Daniel was just talking about that we're focused on the portion of the Minuteman Greenway that's within Arlington, so that 3.6 miles um, extending from just north of Alewife Station all the way to Lexington, which is just um, north and west of Drake Street. And the purpose of this project, the Minuteman Bikeway is incredibly popular, um, but it is to some extent a victim of its own success in, in, a, in the sense of how many people are using it and some maintenance issues. and so. Um, while it is extremely important for commuters and people running errands and as a recreational destination in and of itself, um, we want to also work to identify opportunities to improve safety, comfort, access, and user experience throughout the corridor. And we'll be developing an action plan for pursuing site-specific improvements, as well as thinking about programmatic strategies for ongoing success. In terms of the timeline for this project, uh, we're currently in the existing conditions and outreach phase. So that's the first part that you see from September to November. Um, we are currently uh, doing a survey, which we'll talk more about um, in a little bit. And then as we move into December, we'll be taking all of the feedback that we receive through this community meeting, as well as through that survey, um, synthesizing that, and then drafting a vision for the bikeway. So, a community driven vision for what the bikeway should be in the future. And with that, we'll be developing goals and priorities to help support that vision. Once we get into the spring, we'll be developing recommendations. Um, those are policy, corridor wide, and site specific recommendations. And then lastly, as we get into April and May, we'll be putting that all together into an action plan to help the town implement the recommendations. So, what we're currently working on. Um, really just gathering background documents and reviewing them. We've conducted a couple site visits and done data collection. And as I said, we're in the existing conditions phase. We're analyzing the existing conditions, identifying issues and opportunities. And then um, lastly, we've been distributing a survey. You may have seen us on the path um, a couple weeks ago out there in person handing out surveys. Um, and that survey will be open until November 15th. So if you have not had a chance to fill it out yet, we really encourage you to do so. You can either scan the QR code that's here or we will be, we will be providing the link um, later on at the end of the presentation, we'll have that hyperlink for you so you can access it. Um, and the, it says 899 responses to date. I actually checked this morning and we are over a thousand. So that's very exciting. And we look forward to hearing from the rest of you if you haven't already filled it out. So diving into the initial findings, what we're presenting tonight will just be a first look at the emerging themes and patterns that are helping us identify specific challenges that are being faced by the Minuteman and then the opportunities for improvement. So these are the focus areas that have come to our attention to really look into. So the first is crowding and speed disparities. Um, we know that the Minuteman is, is very popular. There's lots of people on it at any given time. Um, but these people all have different priorities. They're traveling for different purposes and they have different needs and different speeds. Um, so really a wide range of ages and abilities um, as well as modes. And with that, we're seeing increasingly um, issues of speed disparity between these different user types come to the forefront. In terms of wayfinding consisting, consistent signing, um, I also want to use this opportunity to kind of define some of the terms that are going to keep coming up in this presentation. So wayfinding is really any sort of signage that helps people um, navigate. And so that could be along the bikeway itself, or it could be helping people identify how to get to local destinations 
and vice versa, helping people who are maybe in the town centers um, understand that the bikeway is nearby and how to access that. And then we'll also be looking uh, at signage in terms of regulatory and warning signs um, and things that um, dictate how people use the path. Visibility um, or maintenance, we'll be looking at tangible maintenance. So um, the things that are currently issues uh, that could be vegetation, it could be paving. So we'll be looking at those. And then we'll also be thinking about maintenance as a, as a plan programmatically um, so that the town can anticipate and address issues moving into the future. Visibility is a key issue, and this includes visibility of the path itself. So that could be at night, helping path users see the path and see any hazards or um, lumps and bumps that might be in the way. Um, but it also means sight distance. So sight distance at curves, access points, and roadway crossings. We'll be looking at opportunities to activate the path and support a consistent path identity. And this means creating consistency along the bikeway um, in terms of infrastructure and design, as well as the look and feel of the place and making it so that there's activity and areas of interest all along the corridor. For safety and ADA uh, compliance at access points, um, this is a really important focus area. Um, and access points are anywhere that someone can enter or leave the path that is not at a roadway crossing. And then lastly, we'll be looking at safety and consistency at roadway crossings themselves. So as we've said, um, the Minuteman Bikeway is, is extremely popular and there's people walking, biking, running, um, but there's also people rollerblading, skateboarding, there's people in wheelchairs or using other mobility aids, um, people with toddlers, people with dogs. So really that wide range of um, users and user priorities. And one thing that we've noticed, and you can see in the bottom right photo, we've highlighted where adjacent to the path itself, the path has kind of organically expanded to accommodate some of this capacity need. Um, in, in this case, it's kind of a goat path running next to the Minuteman itself. On average, the Minuteman bikeway can see 2,600 users a day. Um, and these counts were taken just south of Swan Place. There's a permanent eco counter there. So um, getting data every single day. Um, this data is from pre-pandemic. And this was mentioned a little bit earlier that before the pandemic counts were going up. And then when the pandemic hit, the use has gone down a bit. Um, and that's kind of a nuanced situation because people are commuting less. Um, but people are also resorting to outdoor recreation much more as a means to just get out of the house, um, have a place to meet up with others. On the flip side of that, it means that when the Minuteman gets crowded, it can discourage people from using it um, just due to concerns about COVID-19. One thing that we've noticed is that the bike and pedestrian volumes are, are not that different throughout the year on average. But it's worth noting that bike volumes tend to be much higher in the warmer months, and then they dramatically drop down, whereas pedestrian volumes um, are really much more consistent throughout the whole year. So thinking about access points, again, these are those places where people can get to the bikeway or leave the bikeway that aren't roadway crossings. What we're seeing is that these access points are often subtle and lack wayfinding. And we're also looking at the frequency and distribution of access points and whether there are opportunities to maybe increase the permeability of the bikeway with neighborhood streets that abut it. Something that we're seeing is limited sight distances at access points. And this is um, problematic from a safety and comfort standpoint because people might be entering the path um, and they aren't uh, path users who are on the bikeway aren't able to see and recognize and react to that person entering um, appropriately. With that, we're also looking at user expectations. So really establishing a set of expectations for what you do when you enter the path or when you leave, um, much in the same way that you would when you were um, on the roadway network. There's kind of that inherent set of expectations for who yields to who. Slope and erosion are issues that we see at some access points, as well as ADA accessibility challenges.
And this map is uh, just summarizing the access points along the bikeway. There are quite a few, but you can see that they're not necessarily evenly distributed throughout the bikeway. We recorded these points, the color coding associates to kind of a category of, of primary issues at the access points. The most common issue that we're seeing is obstructed sight lines at access points. And typically this is due to vegetation overgrowth, but it can also be caused by the path alignment itself. There's a number of different um, signs that are on the bikeway. Some of them are informational, something like a kiosk that you can see on the bottom left or um, an educational sign. There are gateways that let you know that you're entering the bikeway. There's a wayfinding, which might be either on the bikeway itself or on an adjacent road to let you know how to get to the bikeway. And then there's regulatory and warning signs and path use signs, um, which help communicate how users should interact with one another and kind of set the etiquette for the path. And what we're seeing is that there's inconsistent application and design of signs. So you might not run into the same sign at every instance of the same situation, or you might run into different signs trying to communicate the same point, but in a different way. And so that can be confusing to path users. There is a lack of wayfinding between the path the street network and local destinations. So we'll be looking at opportunities to really tie things together um, and just make it a more logical and navigable system. And then there's also varying path use guidance. So again, that goes back to the path etiquette. Um, how are people supposed to use the path and how are they supposed to interact with one another? For maintenance, these are the four kind of main categories that we're seeing issues with. In terms of paving, um, there's a couple different things that typically happen. Um, you can have crack sealing, and that creates a bumpy ride for path users. You can also have more dramatic heaves, which is when um, either the asphalt settles or you have a, a root underneath and it creates kind of a dramatic bump in the pavement, which is definitely something that we want to look out for. Transitions um, are another area that we're looking at. Um, one example would be the bridge that is next to Yates Pond. So just north of Alewife Station, there's a timber bridge. And at either end of that bridge, the pavement transition um, is a challenging one. For vegetation, uh, we're seeing overgrowth, sometimes encroaching on the path. In the bottom photo here, you can see that kind of tunneling effect of all the overgrowth. And it can be really nice, um, but it does reach a point where the overgrowth is inhibiting the, the lateral and vertical clearance of the path itself. And then overgrowth can also block sight lines, views, and lighting. And another thing that has come to our attention is uh, just the, the presence of invasive plants. Drainage throughout the corridor is, is fairly sparse. There's only about six catch basin structures along the corridor. Um, and we do see some uh, standing water and path stability issues near Lowell Street. And then lastly, um, there are a number of bridges along the bikeway. Generally speaking, these are substandard in terms of width to, um, to meet today's standards for a shared use path. Um, but more specifically, the bridge again at Yates Pond, which is a timber bridge, has worn decking and rails. And so that's something that we're looking at. We do want to raise um, two key challenges that are related to maintenance, but also really everything else that we're looking at. Um, the first is that the MBTA owns and maintains the right of way outside of the immediate bikeway alignment. Um, and so that's important to keep in mind. The other thing, um, we've put maintaining ADA compliant access points. So the transitions between access points and the adjacent either roadway or facility um, something that we'll just have to be keeping in mind is jurisdiction and right of way, whether that's um, access points that are entering into MBTA right of way or sometimes a private way, which is a residential, um, a residential street that abuts the bikeway. For lighting, some of the key challenges that we're seeing are that street lighting is found at the at grade crossings, which are primarily in the southeast portion of the bikeway. Um, but there's a lack of lighting at most access points. There is sporadic light spillage from abutting properties, um, which helps light the path helps light the path a bit, but is um, not as effective during the summer months when the trees have foliage. 
And this map just summarizes the light propensity along the bikeway so that you can really see the areas where lighting is limited. The only area where there's dense lighting is at the Mass Ave crossing. And then we see sparse lighting in other locations and then minimally uh, lit segments, which are outlined in red. And that can make it really challenging for path users um, who want to take advantage of the bikeway year round. Other things that we've noticed are that the path currently does not engage the landscape it passes through. Um, when we're thinking about waysides, we're thinking about opportunities to create kind of trailheads and places for people to, to sit, to rest, to regroup, maybe pull over and connect with the people that they're riding with. Um, and it also can mean amenities um, and creating that consistent look and feel throughout the bikeway. There is public art on the bikeway, again, mostly to the, the southeast of the corridor. Um, and there may be opportunities to incorporate more public art potentially through some partnerships. And we've been identifying some potential areas where um, public art could be incorporated. And then lastly, um, we'll be looking at roadway crossings. These are the locations where path users come into conflict with vehicles and where crashes are more likely to occur. Crossings are also really important because they're where path users can access the path um, if they're not near an off-street access point. The key challenges that we're seeing are that there's varied stop control. So at a, an at-grade crossing, you might have a stop control, you might have a yield control with a, an RFB, so one of those flashing beacons, or a signal. Um, and there's also varied pavement marking application. So thinking about how we can make that more consistent, more safe, and more predictable. Sight lines are also a challenge. Um, just having it so that path users and vehicles can see each other approaching and then react appropriately. And then ADA compliance will be something that we're considering at every crossing. These are the focused crossing locations that we'll be looking at in greater detail. Um, I do wanna note that Lake Street and Swan Place, uh, the Swan Place Mass Ave Mystic Ave uh, intersection or crossing, those were recently reconstructed. And so we'll be looking at opportunities to iterate on those designs um, and make some tweaks to make them even better. The other locations that we'll be looking at are Linwood Street, which is by Spy Pond, and then Water Street and Mill Street. So to wrap up our project approach, we are again um, completing that existing conditions analysis, and then we'll be moving into developing a vision and goals to guide recommendations. And with that being the next step, we're really hoping to get some of your input tonight, as well as through the survey to help us understand what the vision for the Minuteman should be. And once we have that, we can develop policy recommendations, as well as broadly applicable corridor-wide recommendations. And then lastly, we'll get into site-specific recommendations at select locations. In the immediate term, this is what we'll be working on. Um, and this is really what we'll be doing um, before you, you next hear from us and next see us. So at this point, um, we're at the q and I do wanna just point out that the link to the survey is here. So again, if you haven't had a chance to fill it out, please do so by November 15th. And if you have any questions about the project, you can contact Daniel um, and his email address is at the bottom of the page. So I think we will we'll do some Q&A if everyone could use their raise hand function and then we will call on you and you can unmute and ask your question. And then um, once we've done the Q&A, we will um, do the breakout groups depending on how many folks we have in the call right now. Um, thank you, Liz. And uh, thank you to Megan for putting the link into the chat. Um, <laughs> I was going to mention that this presentation has been uploaded to the calendar page that's on the town's website where you can find the agenda for this, uh, for this meeting. Uh, and so you could probably link to it through there as well, but you can also go straight to the chat uh, to link to it from there. So yeah, at this point, uh, if anybody has any questions about the project, about the presentation, we're happy to entertain them.
Okay, uh, Beth, go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you, Beth Milovchik. Um, I have a couple of, uh, well, one question uh, and maybe two statements. Um, my question is, um, I, I was surprised that the time for use of the bike trail wasn't mentioned. I believe that uh, there's a certain point in the evening when it becomes closed or is supposed to be closed. I'll say everything and then take my responses. Um, off if that's okay, or what works best. Uh, yes, that's fine. Okay, so what, what are the actual hours for the bike trail? I think that's important for abutters. Um, related to that, of course, the lighting would be important for abutters. Um, I, I want to encourage um, the town to think of the bike trail as a potential, well, it's an existing carbon sink now, but once uh, all of the invasives, particularly the uh, Japanese knotweed is excavated in those trouble spots near Spy Pond and sort of from the high school west. They present um, excellent planting opportunities for native trees. And anyone who knows me is not surprised by this statement because I'm a big tree advocate. And I would really love um, for us uh, you know, in this climate emergency that we're in, recognizing Code Red and that uh, COP26 is happening in Glasgow, that we also think of this bike trail, which is the fabulous resource you described, as a green ribbon through the town from Cambridge to Lexington. And once we get rid of the knotweed, um, again, those fabulous planting opportunities for native trees that will then present wonderful sites for benches that were spoken of. And also I did put in the survey, um, uh, what those water fountains like at World's End, which I think has the best designed one, it's stone, but it has a depression at dog level. So the overflow from when you, <laughs> you're finished drinking goes below for the dog, doesn't just dribble away immediately. There's like overflow also for the dog. So it's a sort of a conservation of water also. Okay, I think that's um, I think that's everything now for now. Thank you so much, and I and um, I love the bike trail. I use it every day, and I also think there are opportunities there for pollinator pathways. So maybe some native milkweed in spots, a ribbon of it. Um, again, once we get rid of the invasives. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Beth, and thank you for those comments. Um, I like what you're saying about the carbon sink and um, you know how we can do that. And I will respond to the question about the, the hours of the pathway. So this actually just came up at a town meeting last year. Uh, I think it was special town meeting that previous to last year, there was an hour, um, there was a time, uh, there were hours on the bikeway, essentially like a park, I believe it was technically closed between like 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. But there was a warrant article for um, actually changing, actually striking that from the, uh, from the town bylaws. Or I should say the original idea was that it would, you know, the idea would be to change the hours so that it would actually have shorter or had, excuse me, longer hours so that it wouldn't be closed for quite as long during the nighttime. But what happened was that uh, there was a substitute motion and that was actually stricken completely. So the bikeway has no hours right now. It's basically can be used 24 seven. Um, so that's uh, what's going on with that. So next person I see is Rod. Hi there. Uh, yeah, uh, I was actually going to speak to, to that point myself, but, but you've covered it brilliantly. Um, the, a uh, thing that, um, well, two, two quick comments. One on lighting. Um, my understanding is that when the bikeway was originally stood up, there was a, um, an understanding with the Conservation Commission that um, uh, there not be lighting. Now, there's a lot of time that's passed and uh, we have uh, on some adjacent uh, 
trails um, in Cambridge and Somerville, for ex example, uh, good, good um, lighting that isn't overbearing but does does help. Um, and what in fact people do at this point is they bring their own lights. Uh, LED bicycle lights are actually quite effective. Um, and uh, so, you know, at any given time, there's, there's some subset of the trail users who are using bicycle lights or using flashlights. Uh, dogs have illuminated collars. It's very cute. Um, but it's also, it also makes a big difference. There are also invisibles, people dressed in black, walking down the path, sometimes pushing baby carriages also in black. Um, a, it's, it's a little hair raising. Anyway, um, that's, that's it for the moment. All right, thank you, Ron. Okay, next, um, there's Sylvia. And, and we are taking notes on all of this, just so you know. <laughs> so Sylvia, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> hi, um, I'm one of the people who uses this almost on a daily basis. I do about 120 miles a week on it. And um, uh, there's, I got a couple, uh, well, I second Beth's uh, comments around the vegetation aspect of it. And um, I think the path can always use more trees for sure. Um, there's a tranquility that you go through just having trees around you, which is really incredibly nurturing to your brain. <laughs> I can't describe it any other way. It's just so nice. Um, I'm wondering um, how and when and who decides on when it gets paved. And the other thing is, um, it's really scary to me that um, you would never ever take your kid who's learning to drive on the highway, but parents take kids who are like three and four, maybe even five, who've never been on bikes on this, um, bikeway and I just find it incredibly dangerous um, and in talking to other people who use the the path a lot uh, biking they think that these are the most dangerous times is when these um, parents have these kids that are just learning um, there has to be some education component to this I mean um, it's just you just shouldn't be teaching young kids to ride a bike on the bike path. I, it's nice, it would be nice, but there's just too many people that are biking on it. Um, so anyways, those are my comments. Um, I think the bike path is one of the best things in Arlington. And um, if I ever, I mean, it would keep me from moving if I need to move. I just cannot believe how much I enjoyed this piece through Arlington. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, I will mention, um, I think we've got a, several more hands up, but we, uh, for more commentary and, and things we do, um, you know, have the breakout group session meant more for that. So, but uh, happy to entertain a few more, I think the uh, last few people that have their hands up now. Uh, I see Linson is next. Uh, sorry, just unmuting myself. So I'm just kind of curious as to the outreach for the various like interest groups. So for lack of a better word, because I know there are a lot of different folks who I kind of don't want to not hear from that I see on the bike path, be it seniors who use it to exercise, be it the stroller, the families with strollers, be it like little kids riding bikes, be it the people with the e-bikes, like there's a lot of different levels of usage. And I wanna make sure we all consider that. And the reason why I ask is because there's like about 60 people here on this. I know there's more people who use it there. I've seen the survey going around to certain groups, specific groups. I just wanna make sure that if whatever direction we go, it kind of encompasses as many of the users as possible. Cause that's, that's pretty important to me. Cause I, I 
even though there are you know potential issues with that it, it's great to see so many people out and using this great resource thank you that's a good question um first i'll say that we have tried to use a number of different methods for getting um getting people to know about this project um we've put up some flyers around uh put up i I personally put up the art signs along the bikeway. So it has information about the survey and the project and also the um, this meeting here. I know that we've had a few, uh, somebody sent around information to the parent teacher organizations in town. Um, we tried to distribute it through our town channels, but also through regional channels like Mass Bike, um, since this is not just a town resource, but a regional resource as well. Um, so I mean, we've tried a number of methods, and of course, we did those intercept surveys, or Kittleson uh, staff did an intercept surveys. I don't know, Liz, if you want to add anything more to that. Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. And we the, the yard signs that Daniel put out, um, those are an opportunity to hopefully get some people who just use the path daily. Um, we did do intercept surveys. It was challenging to get people to stop who were running or biking. So, you know, that's that's just a shortcoming of, of doing that kind of outreach. Um, but in terms of proportions, the intercept survey where we did in person, um, actually gave the survey in person, we got about 60 responses. And for the online survey, we've gotten already 1100 responses. So um, there is a lot of outreach. Um, I would encourage you if you have other avenues that you think it could be distributed in to, to let us know. I did not know about the intercept surveys. That's great. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, uh, Jennifer is next. Thank you. Um, I really wanted to speak up in favor of improving the lighting and the wayfinding you know i use the minuteman trail both for walking and for biking love it recreationally but i think especially considering the climate uh, crisis that we're in it is an incredibly valuable resource and tool for us for also transportation and getting around our neighborhood i use it to get to alewife i use it to go to you know um, medical appointments on Mill Street or shopping up near Trader Joe's and other places further out of, of Arlington. Um, we really do need better lighting. You know, it gets dark in the winter months by 4.35 o'clock. That is a very reasonable, legitimate time to be out there using it for transportation. And we uh, expecting people to bring their own flashlights or strap lights all to themselves is not the way cities work. And so I think that is really an important complement to what we're already doing in other places. The wayfinding as well, you know, I have my little turnoff memorized. I kind of know about when to find it and what the trees look like there, but it would be incredibly difficult to find if you didn't know, already know where it was. And then it goes on to a private way and there is no signage or anything there. So these shouldn't be hidden. People should be able to find out where they are and know that this spot is over there and the drugstore is over here. So, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, next person is Paula. Uh, Paula Herman. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to speak to the issue of small kids, all kinds of people in the bikeway. I used to use a lot to walk, to walk to places for exercise till I got knocked down and injured by a young child learning to ride, who then rode fast into my, behind me, because he was frightened of the adult riders coming in the other direction and was avoiding them. Um, I have two questions in that respect. Could the bikeway be widened anywhere? And also, could there be timing for who could walk, ride it when? Like, perhaps only bicycle commuters at certain hours perhaps only walkers at certain hours 
And I don't know about little kids learning to ride their bike, but I just wonder if those issues, those could be ways of addressing those issues. Thank you, Paul. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm very sorry that that happened to you. Um, and I hope that you're uh, on the mend. Um, Liz, do you have any uh, response you have you want to give? Um, yeah, so widening the path is something that we're looking into. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is just looking at the engineering constraints along the corridor um, and also keeping in mind, as we said before, the jurisdiction and right of way constraints. But something that we've been talking about is other opportunities to kind of manage um, path user demand. So widening would be one opportunity to do that. And we're looking into that, the feasibility of it. Um, but we're also looking into other strategies to, to manage, um, you know, manage different types of users within the space that we have. So definitely an important consideration. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I see um, we've got Alan. Mustafa and Elaine. So um, after these three, then we're going to go on to the breakout groups. So Alan, go ahead. I uh, just wanted to briefly point out a couple of things. The introduction referred to this uh, bikeway for non-motorized path. I just wanted to highlight that it's currently being used for uh, motorized transportation, uh, specifically electric bikes and similar kinds of vehicles. And the legislature is considering legislation that would uh, kind of normalize that. Uh, also, uh, on drainage, uh, just wanted to point out that uh, one of the related issues is either uh, rainwater or snow melt cooling on the path and then freezing and creating an ice hazard. All right, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, and then Mustafa. Yeah, um, actually, Alan just mentioned what I was going to raise is um, we, there was a big fix done for the drainage um, near Lake Street, but further east of that, there's a place where it does pool and freeze. And also at the Water Street crossing, and um, I'm, I'm missing the other crossing, but in that area, there's sort of a deep rut, frozen, mystery, puddle situation. You don't know what your wheel's really going into. Um, so I think overall, it'd be good for um, you know, maybe do an assessment of the, the path um, after a few heavy rains or during a freeze thaw period. And as part of this work, just really clean up a lot of these because they're, they're hazards for everybody in every sense of the word. Um, and, and I just would reiterate, I think, um, the, the wayfinding um, and the access to Brattle Street and the access to um, Grove Street, which there really isn't one. These are, I mean, these would make it much more valuable to a lot of other areas of town. I know that there's going to be a new access at the high school, but um, but those access, you know, the Brattle Street access is, is a mess, and they're really you have to walk your bike down at Grove Street, and and these are pretty sort of central areas of the town that you don't have access to. So I'd like to see that kind of overall infrastructure be focused on as well. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. And then the last person I have is Elaine. Yes, hi. Um, yeah, I was interested in encouraging um, uh, perhaps a, hello, can you hear me? Um, yes, I can hear you. I, I was perhaps uh, I'm encouraging some uh, amount of assessment of uh, areas where there are sort of re rebounding or a little bit of, of rebound of uh, native species along the bike path already um, and not having and to flag those and not have those completely destroyed by um, by whatever equipment is is brought on to uh, redo various as parts of the of the path and um, the other thing is I know that there is interest in doing bike mountain bike uh pathways in the hills hill area and um and a pump park um and so i, I would encourage the town to um to sort of combine resources and think creatively about ways to uh perhaps um combine efforts uh 
for this uh, pump park idea that might take less, uh, more of the heavy traffic off of the Hills Hill area and site it closer to the bike path with bike path entrance so that, um, so that kids could have a place to do that type of mogul riding without um, destroying other habitat. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Or, excuse me, Elaine. <laughs> um, yes. Yes, thank you for your comment. Yeah, I appreciate that. And yeah, I've heard about the idea for the pump park. Um, I think, um, Paula, did you have one more thing you wanted to ask? I just forgot to uh, take my hand down. Oh, okay, no problem. Okay, um, so Liz, I think we can we can move on. I think we've got um, not too many people for breakout groups, so that's great. Uh, do you want to talk through kind of how uh, how we're going to do this? Yeah. So uh, these are the the question prompts that we have for everyone, and what we're going to do is randomly assign you to different breakout groups where you will be met by one of us, um, someone with facilitator in front of their name. And we will walk you through these questions and we will be recording all of your thoughts um, kind of on a, a shared board that you can see and interact with. So we will do that um, for about 20 minutes and then we'll come back to this main room automatically and we will, um, all the facilitators will do a report back to let everyone know the key themes that came out of each group. So I think at this point we can go ahead and, um, and join those breakout groups. If and just, you, to be, oh, sorry, yeah. just to be clear, we're not, uh, we won't be recording the like, like video record the breakout groups, but we'll be typing them on, like typing comments onto like an online shared board. Okay, well, thank you everyone for participating in those breakout groups. Um, I think what we'll do now is a quick report back. So I'll start by sharing my screen and just talking quickly about what my group covered, and then I will pass it to one of our other facilitators so everyone can see what everyone else talked about. And then the last thing that we'll do is in the chat, we'll post a link to another one of these boards. So if you think of anything later that you wanna add, if you have visioning ideas that you wanna share with us, um, please feel free to add those later. So I will get started. Okay, so in terms of things that our group discussed that, that are enjoyable, um, safety from separation of vehicles was brought up as not necessarily enjoyable, but definitely a stress reliever. Uh, green space and access to open space and recreational opportunities was a big one. Um, convenience, we have someone from Lexington in our group, and so uh, having that, that accessibility from, you know, between communities all the way from Lexington um, and then to the T and into Boston. Um, and then things that stand in the way of enjoying the Minuteman. Um, crowding came up um, really as kind of the main theme throughout our conversation. Um, as children and having unpredictable users on the bikeway was another thing that came back up. Um, people mentioned that they actually avoid using the bikeway on weekends because it's, there's just too many folks out there. Um, predictability was a really big thing. So the types of users that are out there and, and having predictable interactions with them, um, as well as at the intersections, um, so at roadway crossings as well. And it was brought up that there's a lack of trust when you get to roadway crossings, um, trusting that vehicles will do what they're supposed to do or yield to you when they are meant to yield and then also that path users will do what's expected of them. Um, an example of something really great that was brought up is the Bruce Friedman Trail as an example of, of landscaping and just um, identity of the trail as something to potentially emulate. And then um, in terms of our vision for this group, we talked about um, just different ways to potentially separate out users, whether physically or in time, um, the addition of more amenities, and a desire to have fewer roadway crossings, um, or at least um, address those roadway crossings in a way that is more amenable to path users. So that was our discussion. Um, I will pass it off to Daniel next. Cool, thanks. Um, then I guess I'll share mine. <clears throat> um, 
Okay, so. Oops. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And um, so I had a, a few people in. Oops, a few people in the um, in my breakout group, and I think everyone was living lived in Arlington. Um, I think one person who was actually about it, the, the bikeway, and definitely what I heard first was um, uh, lots of love for the bikeway um, in everybody's short intro, um, and the reason for some people why they moved to Arlington was the um, was the path and the ability to get around easily, you know, without a car. Um, I think that was, and the ability, um, I think something that was really uh, great somebody mentioned is that you can get into the city without having to drive and you can get out into the country into like sort of Bedford, Acton, Concord, um, sort of you go far enough, you know, you can, it can bring you all the way out there. So, um, <clears throat> what people really enjoy, you know, is that it, so it is car free. You see everybody sort of on the path, um, the great variety of people, um, you know, it's sort of a commons where you can meet kind of anybody and, you know, it runs through the whole town. So you can do, you can get to lots of places. You can get, get to almost every, anywhere in the town, more or less, all the commercial areas, um, do your errands and do your shopping and, and get to work and that kind of thing. Um, you can, you know, even though uh, you know you, you can you can your kids can ride on there and uh, before you know you feel comfortable with them going through um, riding on the road in car traffic so you know car free is important um, and um, some of the I think the natural aspects of it it, it um, you know being kind of dark or being kind of like uh, more natural park like I think that was another piece of it and then I guess. We didn't exactly get to what would be perfect, but I think some of these sort of what stands in the way maybe gets to the question about being perfect, like um, <clears throat> more connections, better connections, especially on the south side between like Jason Street and Brattle Street uh, past like the high school. Like there aren't very many good connections from the south side of town to the bikeway from from sort of that stretch of it. Um, some access points are not very, or, or kind of ad hoc, not very well done, You're not even seemingly very safe for like children to use, like once they get more independent, um, people are, need to behave better. <laughs> Sometimes people uh, don't, um, they sort of leave the path or jump off the path and don't think about looking to see if they're, you know, somebody's trying to pass them or uh, they might run into somebody. So um you know, speeds were uh, also mentioned as an issue and sort of electrified vehicles that are not bikes even, like scooters or skateboards or one wheels. Um, and then um, sort of an interesting idea that came up was about if we widened the path, like could you put reflectors like on in the path, like on the roadways so that if you do have a light that you can make sure you don't sort of navigate off the path accidentally. Um, I thought that was an interesting idea. Um, so I think making it better for um, children to use, understanding like the sort of rules about electric vehicles and making the access points better, you know, I think those would make a more perfect minute man. Thanks. Uh, I guess we can go to Mallory. I will stop sharing. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so we have a few technical difficulties, so I don't have a screen to share, but I have our group's uh, feedback. So I believe everyone in our group uh, has lived in Arlington at least for a few years, um, if not much longer. Um, so uh, there was certainly was a lot of love for the Minuteman. Um, a theme that came up was simply having options uh, for commutes, for recreation, for errands, uh, whether that was choosing between taking Mass Ave biking um, and taking the bikeway or uh, taking the bus or another form of transportation. There are simply fewer hazards um, and a more enjoyable experience overall. Um, another item that everyone loved was just access to nature and recreation, both uh, the bikeway itself being a peaceful place and having access to uh, wonderful places like Great Meadows. Um, in that same vein that it's a family friendly area and it's a great opportunity for exercise. Um, there were a few things that stand in the way of enjoying the Minuteman or using it more. Um, one of those is uh, having more, having that there aren't enough access points to stores 
Uh, so running practical errands like uh, getting to the grocery store or being in Arlington Center, uh, those uh, access points uh, are difficult. Another item was that bike parking is too limited um, in, in all areas and uh, lighting. Um, so there were a few examples of a few hazardous encounters that folks had had um, due to uh, lack of lighting. Um, and the perfect Minuteman bikeway, um, one item that uh, someone in our group brought up was having more waypoints or pull-off points and the width. Um, an example of um, along the Somerville community path where there's a porous material where a lot of times people will um, run or, or walk was used as an example. Um, and uh, to round it out, uh, somebody else said that the perfect Minuteman uh, means that we'll just have more bike paths in general in town. We're asking a lot of the one that we have. Um, that, so that's uh, our group's feedback. Thank you. So we can, um, let's pass it off to Megan. Great. All right, so we had um, a lot of love for the bikeway as many groups did. Um, a lot of Arlington Heights residents, um, people who use it for commuting, for recreation, school pickup, errands, pretty much you name it. Um, generally, um, the main themes were people, people come to the bikeway to experience some natural beauty, to be in a quiet place, kind of get out of the, the city life. Um, there was a, there was, it was expressed that people feel comfortable walking and biking there at pretty much any time of day. Um, but we did also hear some concerns about um, the lack of lighting, um, especially when you might be relying on blue bikes with uh, inconsistent lighting uh, ability. Um, we also talked about how it does get pretty busy, especially on those really beautiful summer days when it seems like everyone is out there at the same time. Um, and we talked a little bit about, you know, some people who want to ride for exercise or who are really trying to get somewhere quickly might end up on Mass Ave instead, just knowing that they are going to not have as many uh, people to kind of weave around. Um, and then when we talked about the perfect Minuteman bikeway, um, we talked about improving some access points. Um, you know, we, we, we recognize the difficulties in doing that, but talked about how some of the, um, you know, ADA issues and paving are a real problem. Um, we talked about uh, improving wayfinding and signs um, and also touched on a few problem intersections, particularly Mill Street. Um, and we talked about how the way that Lake Street, the new Lake Street design separates users and kind of widens out as you reach the intersection has been really positive and that that could be a good thing to emulate in other locations. And I will pass it off to Caitlin. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, a lot of overlap. Oh, are you seeing my screen? Yep. Yeah, we can yeah see there was um, a lot of overlap. I think we heard a lot of the same things. Um, so I'll try to point out some, some different things. Uh, the members in my breakout group were all really from Arlington. A lot of them had used the path today, um, used it weekly to walk, to recreate, to exercise. Um, dog walking is a, is a, common occurrence on the path. So we talked about that. Um, a lot of a lot of us enjoy the Minuteman as an efficient and safe way to travel. Um, people enjoy traveling and being in nature, being surrounded by trees, um, and really just avoiding cars and avoiding traffic um, that's common during rush hour and, and peak hour travel. So that was that was a common theme. Um, it's a great public space. Um, someone mentioned the diversity of users on the path is really nice. Um, another element, one of the users in my group um, told a story about teaching her child how to ride their bike on the path and how it's really only one of the few safe spaces um, to do that in the city. So kind of leading into 
um, things that detract from the Minuteman common occurrence are speeding users, inconsiderate users, um, people just traveling too, too quickly, um, passing aggressively, um, or even users kind of walking their dogs and not standing in the right area. What else? Some recommendations to target some of those challenges. Um, we talked about adding in some speed signs or education and enforcement for using the path safely and effectively. Um, we talked about using that through like speed limit signs or um, pavement markings indicating slow areas or potentially having even shoulders or areas for users to pass, um, to step aside, to step out of the moving moving lane. Um, benches were also mentioned as well as native plantings. Um, you know, there's a lot of invasive species and poison ivy specifically were talked about on different areas of the path. So really focusing on removing those and adding in native plantings. Um, yeah, we talked a little bit about aesthetic improvements and just kind of creating a destination throughout the path. And when one user talked about um, liking the distinction on different segments of the path and really not needing to create a uniform branding necessarily, but enjoying the, the characters of each path um, as a user travels along the path. And I think the last facilitator is Connor. Pass it over to you. All right. Um, can you get now the screen showing right? Great. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So as Caitlin just pointed out, a lot of the comments are. It's, it's great to hear a lot of the same themes. I think across groups. <clears throat> I'll try to highlight some of the ones that really st stood out. I think um, you know people use the path for access, and it, it's a it's actually a functional means of of, of life. Um, one one parents talked about they can they can trust their responsible children to get to school or get to sports fields um, on the path sooner than you could using a street like Mass Ave. Um, being able to have a calm, quiet experience, with, which allows for conversation. That's something you don't get walking around on lots of other streets or biking on other streets. Um, so that's a unique amenity that the Minuteman provides. Um, and you know, a, a, an important alternative to Mass Ave in a number of ways, not, not least of which is safety and comfort for people biking. Um, when we talked about things that stand in the way from enjoying more, crowding came up from a couple of participants. Um, some people, as was mentioned earlier, some people in, in our breakout group avoid Minutemen altogether in either like summer seasons, busy seasons, and times when they feel like biking on it would be dis, um, discourteous. Um, speaking of which, etiquette came up by a, a couple times and the need for clearer guidance on um, what is appropriate etiquette. For example, um, calling out something like on your left as a cyclist is passing walkers is, um, is seen by some walkers as, as an important um, behavior. And also at the same time, probably some cyclists feel like it's rude. So we have a little bit of a, a disconnect between what's what's helpful and what's what's perceived, which could be um, helped by, by signs and, and guidance offered on the trail, just explaining clearly what is expected, uh, at least puts everyone on the same page. Um, and, and then lastly, having things to access right along the path, whether that be pop-up coffee stations or um, other, other opportunities for businesses that are located not far from Mass Ave, I'm sorry, not far from the Minuteman, but might, might be able to, um, set up a, a pop-up nearby could be a really nice benefit to people. Um, we didn't make it to the fourth question, so that's, that's all I have for now. Back to Liz or Dan? Dan. Uh, I like, I like, I'm still thinking about that pop-up idea. I think that's a, that's a great idea. It's interesting. I hadn't thought of that before. Um, so I don't know, Liz, do you want to share I think maybe at one slide or just sort of the closing slide after this, um, just for anybody that hasn't um, taken the survey yet, there's a survey link up there. There's also a link, the project page is sort of the, the bike advisory committee page. Um, 
And I think I think that is pretty much it. Um, sorry, Liz, do you want to? Yes, sorry, just getting my presentation back up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. you. Yeah. Yep, so um, link to the survey is here, link to the project website is here, as well as the email address if you have any questions. Um, we did just drop in the chat a link to the, um, the concept board, um, but I did just get a message from someone um, that they were getting a request for a password, so we might need to just reshare that quickly. Oh, okay. And if anyone has tested it and can let me know if they can get in. I think you have to sign it as a guest. You will have to sign it as, an, as a guest, but you shouldn't need a password. I'm seeing other, um, I'm seeing several people in the, in the board right now. So okay. I think it may just be the need to create um, a login. Okay. And we'll leave that board open. Um, we'll close it tomorrow morning, um, just so that this is kind of a concise part of this um, public outreach effort. So if you have any thoughts later this evening, you can add those in and we will definitely get those and record them um, along with everything else that we heard tonight. So with All right. that. Yeah, we're right at time. Good timing. <laughs> exactly 8.30. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thanks to the town staff for helping out and to Kittleson for, for coming out as well. Um, it was a great presentation and I look forward to the next steps. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you.